Today, we welcome you to Tortoise Nirvana. Hey, what's going on? Ken and Harkin here, and I'm coming to you from one of the field trips the Turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group is putting on at their yearly conference in Arizona. I'm with Bob Bloom and a bunch of the biggest turtle nerds in the world, and today we're going to look at his collection of turtles and tortoises. So, this is going to be a really exciting day for us. As a pro bike rider, action sports announcer, and off-road adventurer, I'm always on the go. But for my true passion as a reptile breeder, I created my own sanctuary in South Florida. This is Camp Kenneth. Bob Bloom's place in Arizona is a reptile lover's playground. We are talking over 15 acres full of some of the coolest animals on the planet. How long have you been in this uh, area? For About this 16 facility? years. It's kind of a thing that just continues to grow, you know, I'm never done, there's always a project to do. And so, how many years have you been into turtles and tortoises? Ah, uh, since I was about, man, I'll tell you what, since I was about five years old, and so I've been producing tortoises for quite a long time, actually, in different species. I was into snakes for a while, but I kind of, I kind of got out of that. Now the tortoises, I just like them better, you know, they're just uh, species that you think they require a lot of care, but if you set them up right and you give them what they need, they'll reproduce them. Bob takes pride in his setups. Thousands of blocks have gone into the construction of these pens, and he doesn't overpopulate them. Each of these pens will only have up to eight Hermans or radiated tortoises, giving them plenty of space, and the proof is in the results. His animals are spectacular. This was a tortoise that had made a trade on. I traded a Burmese star for a pair. And I wanted to show them this tortoise was really awesome looking when it was smaller. And it still is. I was going to say, it's not awesome looking anymore. Yeah, it is. But if you would have seen the color, they were really vibrant. And now as I get older, I mean, it still is. But, you know, they grow really fast in Arizona. They can grow up to like two, three inches a year if you get them set up. They just really jam. As far as diet, are you doing a lot of natural Mostly stuff? Mostly natural. These pans, you don't see any alfalfa anymore because they pretty much hit it down. But there's like uh, usually alfalfa. Bermuda and clover. This is called Palestinian clover. And um, I use that basically. And then I'll throw soft like zucchini and carrots in there and sometimes Missouri tortoise diet, not too often, but if you really want tortoises to be healthy and, and grow smooth like that, you really need to keep a natural diet. Yep. And humidity helps too, you know. The only thing I, I didn't find out just recently, that I guess that peach leaves, when they fall, they give cyanide. Yeah. That told me so. Now I'm like, great, you know. You gotta pull out the now I gotta pitch. rake the yeah, or, or rake the leaves up so they don't eat them. I think that's part of the fun though, growing the food for the animals. You know, I, like that's what I really love. I enjoy planting stuff at home, and then you know you don't have to worry so much about yeah. A lot of people feed the produce and stuff, and that winds up well. They have to you're sometimes. You're limited yeah. by space, which I'm not. So this was a small tortoise, about two inches. When I got it, and just being outside, you can see the growth has come in. I really think it's important to give them the right nutrition. I, I think a lot of people don't do that, you know. Okay, we'll head down this way. There might not be too much out. The pure passion Bob has is really awesome. This guy is doing it right, providing natural nutrition and a well plan for home. What's even cooler is outside of the animals that he keeps, the place is also littered with wild desert creatures like this cool little Gila monster. And you've also got these guys, the Western Diamondback. Anytime you can walk in your backyard and find Gila monsters and rattlesnakes, you're pretty pumped. That snake is actually in the worst possible position he could ever want to be, as you see. But you look at this animal, it's not even hasn't even struck at anyone. No snake will bite to attack people. It's always defensive. So. And this, this guy isn't even rattling. But the real highlight here are the sulcatas. Lots of them. We're talking hundreds. How yeah, many exactly. males do you have in this size group that you have here? Don't even ask. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I get a lot just of stuff given to me. It's just big enough that they don't have Yeah, to there's about 45 in this pen, and you don't see them all the time. Uh, in, a, in August, when it's hot, when you turn that spigot on over there, they come running from every direction. 
But you like have five or six males in here at least. I would say probably more like 10 or 15. Yeah. And they fight amongst each other, but one thing having a pen this big is they'll get away from each other. Right. You know, you'll still find them flipped. I have to make rounds and make sure. Uh, every once in a while, one will get damaged around the neck area. You say um, you have a full-time job. What do you do when they're laying eggs? Do you have somebody work for you collect? No, I, love them in the, I just leave them in the ground. Huh. I let them hatch. In August, there's uh, <laughs> rains. I used to, if I, if I see them landing when I'm um, here, I'll gather them up. But I've noticed over about the 20 or 5 years I've been doing this, if you leave the eggs in the ground and they hatch naturally, you're going to see a hatchling come out that's twice as healthy and sturdy and hardy than one that you incubate. They'll have a totally different color. Uh, they're more, more robust. I think if anything is weak, it's not going to hatch anyway in the ground. So, let me go show you the bigger ones from John. Yeah, this is awesome. So how about this, guys? <laughs> this is about as close to Africa as you're gonna get in North America when raising sulcata tortoises. There are actually three female sulcata tortoises in the entrance to this burrow. Now, I'm not gonna risk going any deeper because there's a lot of Gila monster and uh, Western diamondback rattlesnakes around this joint. But I just wanted to show you by getting in this burrow just how big they can excavate burrows. I mean, this is incredible. So, you know, talking with Bob, some of the challenges for me in Florida is my water table is so high that I can't allow these guys to burrow because they'll get collapses. Well, here in the desert of Arizona, he really doesn't worry too much about that. Now, that being said, they do in fact have a monsoon season here, and he does worry about collapses when it starts to rain here. This dirt, it becomes quite crumbly, you can see. It definitely crumbles out, but man, is this incredible? I'm actually inside a Sulcata tortoise burrow. Man, the only thing that would be better than this is me actually being in the Sahel region of Africa inside one. But I'm gonna let these girls relax and I'm gonna crawl on out. Wild. Oh, so cool. So you're looking at what I think is the biggest Sulcata I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but Bob is actually looking because he's not quite sure this is the big one. I think that is. It is, right? I think yeah. it is. Look, Look at this thing. This is a monster. He says it takes three people just to lift it to get it into its winter retreat. You guys know I love sulcatas. This has been an amazing treat. He's got literally hundreds of adult sulcatas here. But again, look at this monster. I mean... For an animal like this to have existed in the wild, it would have had to gone through so much just to get to this size. This is incredible. And so since it's after Halloween, they get a little pumpkin treat. And actually pumpkin will work as a natural anti-wormer. So seasonally, they're gonna get this and it helps, you know, that hard skin on the pumpkin helps wear down the beak. And uh, man, just look at this monster. Hey, Bob. That's him. Yeah, how old do you reckon this guy is? Well, they said they got him in 85. Has 11 inch animals. That's what they're telling me. If you can believe that or not, I don't oh know. But gosh. it's still growing. I mean, you can see in between the. Yeah, the scoots. It's slowing real slow, though. Maybe like barely a 16th of an inch. That's just incredible. It's big. Notice how they're different than most Okadas. They're really. Domed. Yeah, they're high domed. I mean, there are some in here that are flat. The females, they're not that really that big. There's a couple that maybe are like 120 pounds, but for the majority of them, I mean, they're they're. Now small. these animals were they always allowed to burrow uh, when they were being raised up? Um, you know? Or were their these... area is sand and they they collapse? Okay. Um, because I have they have they have dug burrows and the most of them fell in. If you walk around, you could actually probably stick a like a small VW car in them. My they God. dig them so big. It, this is the biggest sulcata I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. So, well, thanks for showing me around today, man. I really appreciate no it. No problem. And, uh, I didn't even get to show you the lizards and everything. If you had time, I'd show you the tinosaurs and that to do, uh, do over there, too. Well, that's something to look forward to in the next trip, man. All uh, right. Thanks. Thanks. So much, Bob. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks so much for watching our final episode of the season on Camp Kennan. We'll be back after the new year, but as always, be sure to head to the Camp Kennan channel on YouTube this week and every week for more bonus videos and become a subscriber today. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram at Camp Kennan. See you next year.